please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. Lord God, by the power of your spirit, enlighten our eyes, instruct our minds, put joy into our hearts, and revive our souls, so that our lips and our lives may bear witness to your word. Amen. The Psalter reading today is from Psalms 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than the gold. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Can, Can all people, how often they offend, cleanse me from my secret faults? Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Amen. The scripture reading today is from James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sin shall be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and earth and yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God.
just a minute. Mary's going to come and share with us um, some news from Family Promise and how more ways we can get involved perhaps and whatever else is on our heart. But I did want to um, close the loop with the book of James. During September, I've done a series on the book of James. And it's really um, often a neglected book. Back in the day, Martin Luther called it uh, the straw gospel um, because of its emphasis on what we do rather than on what we think. Um, It's not that James thinks that one should earn salvation. Rather, James wants the believer to make their faith real. I think James wants us to be incarnational. We believe God's love for us took on flesh and walked among us. I think that's our goal for our faith in Jesus. The hope we and love we have from God for those things to be realized, actualized, tangible in our flesh, in our families, our schools, our workplaces, our churches, and our community. James wants us to just do it. It's like he worked for Nike. September's also the time when we prepare for the peacemaking offering that we will collect next week on World Communion Sunday. Peacemaking sounds so esoteric, esoteric and lofty. But the connections to James is just this. Peacemaking is the sum of all the little decisions, the total of our interactions with one another. It is what we do. Sometimes we think of peacemaking as big moments, as when treaties are signed to end wars, or when world leaders gather to make decisions. Mother Teresa was once asked how regular people could promote peace. Go home, she said, and love your family. This year, our peacemaking speaker is Mary Giordano, the executive director of Family Promise, a ministry um, which puts our faith into action and through which we help to provide families an environment in which they can um, find peace and grow in love and experience God's hope. So Mary, come and tell us how to just do it with Family Promise. Good morning, everybody. And and really, I, I want to thank Karen again for inviting me to be here. When she called me and asked me to speak to you today, I told her how much it meant to me because we've been doing Family Promise now since, well, we started serving families in April of 2015. And when I can come and speak here, it gives me a chance to reflect about why we're doing it, how it all started, and a chance to invite all of you to get involved in some way. So I'm not sure how many people here today actually are volunteers for Family Promise, but if you are and you could raise your hand, that would be wonderful for me to see. Oh my goodness, we have a lot of volunteers here. So if you could do that one more time, and if everyone could look around and see who's involved, because you might have questions, and I think that it's always wonderful to be able to ask people who have actually been doing it, <laughs> you know, to be been involved in this ministry that, that is very special to me, and I know special to all of you that have been part of it. So Family Promise began here, as I said, in April of 2015, but it's really in many, many places throughout the country and still relatively new to us. But it was a way of caring for homeless families that was very, very different. It is very important, of course, that the government, you know, does their part 
you know, these families are very, very needy and they need a lot of help. And they do apply for the, to the Department of Social Services to help them with things like food and a place to live. But sometimes those efforts really do fall short. And some people are afraid to go. They're afraid they'll lose their children if they say they're homeless. They're afraid of what life might be like in what's called a contracted shelter. And there are some contracted shelters here that do wonderful work and serve many families, but they may be just afraid to go there. But Family Promise is just a way of bringing people together from various faith communities to serve the homeless. So right here at Del Mar Presbyterian, you guys have rooms that you use for many things. It could be religious education, meetings, your library. Um, those spaces are converted so that each family that is homeless, that's part of Family Promise, has a place to be safe and sleep here, receive healthy meals, spend time with people who really, really care about them, and make them feel part of the community. I will tell you that our families love being here. They love the love, the warmth, the support, the food, the playground. Think about it. What a cool place. This is their home. When they're here, this is their home. I know some of our families have even been here to, um, to be with you on a Sunday morning. I think one of our guests even sang in the choir, as I recall. So when you think about what you've done, it's because of those of you that are participating in the program, but it's also those of you that are praying for our families. That's also so important. So I'm asking you to continue to do those things and to think about getting really involved and why it's something you might want to do. Um, when we were talking about St. James, St. James was all about putting things into action and going out and living, living the gospel, living the life that we're called to live. I see Family Promise as that opportunity to do just that, to be able to do it in a place that you feel safe coming to every Sunday, and to be able to open your hearts and open your, your, your time, your talent, so many different ways you can connect with our families. Some of them need work. Sometimes you can talk to them about what happened, maybe, and they'll share with you. We don't ask that you directly ask them what happened, but as they get to know you, they will. They'll open up their stories and be able to tell you different things that happened that maybe led to their homelessness. When we started Family Promise, we thought we would be serving mostly families who are very unexpectedly homeless, perhaps through a fire, perhaps through job loss, um, sometimes the death of a family member. And we have seen some of those families, but many of the families that we're serving have been homeless at different times. And what happens is, through some assistance through the government, they're able to get an apartment, they're able to get a job, but because of underlying problems, they find themselves homeless again. So what we do is slow everything down. We look at the big picture and we try to help them with all of those things that have led to their homelessness. In some cases, it's health issues. Perhaps they don't even have health insurance and they don't know how to get on the exchange, the New York State Health Exchange, and get those health benefits. Maybe they're unsure how to apply for SNAP benefits. That used to be called food stamps. Or WIC, which is women and children and being able to apply for those things. So we look at that first. And then we talk to them about what type of work do they want to do. First, can we make that happen? Did they finish high school? Can we get them into a program that they can earn their high school diploma and then maybe go into a job training program? So we do what we call slow down housing. It's the complete opposite of what is being, um, I would say, encouraged throughout the country today, which is rapid rehousing. Many of the contracted shelters actually receive grant funding for rapidly helping families find an apartment. But if you don't solve those underlying problems, you'll probably find yourself homeless again. That's what we see. And I'm proud to tell you today that our families that we have served are still in their homes. <laughs> We're still helping them. We thought it'd be for a year when they found their own homes that we would, you know, they'd be really on their own, so to speak. But every single family that we have served, we've stayed connected to if they've stayed connected to us. That means we see them often. We um, speak to them by phone. Uh, we ask them if there's anything we can do that can help them, you know, really keep their lives happy. And I'm really excited to tell you that they're doing well. They're all doing well, and they're very, very grateful for the support that they were given here when they were here. Family Promise is also about partnerships, partnerships with different faith communities. And you may know that many of the congregants from B'nai Shalom are Family Promise volunteers, and they come here to serve with you. That is absolutely beautiful. It is something I love to share when I go from place to place to talk about the program, because that's what this is all about. It's about faith communities coming together four weeks out of the year, and it rotates. There are 13 host sites where the families stay. So this week, 
They are at, let me think now, St. Gabriel's in Rotterdam. Next week, they're going to be at Mater Christi Parish on Whitehall Road. Then they're coming here. They're coming here to spend a week with you. And then they go to different congregations. And then, as I said, there are 13. And then about two or three months, they'll come back here. The reason we do that is so that the families not only meet many, many people and have many special people to interact with, but where they're staying does not become their home, so to speak. It's their temporary home. So there's encouraging for them to eventually have their own place and for them to stay. We have a day center that's on New Scotland Avenue in Albany. That's where the families shower, do their laundry, and that's where we do some of the work to help them find their place to live and find a job. You're most welcome to visit our day center. It's located at 738 New Scotland Avenue. It's a former parsonage of Bethany Reformed Church. So it's a very, very lovely place for the families to, set, to stay. We generally serve two to four families at one time, and their stay with us is determined by their needs. So we do not say to them after a few months, why are you still here? We say, what more can we do? Just do it, right? That's what we have to do. We want them to keep doing it, but we need to encourage them. Because it's not always easy, is it? To not know exactly how your life is going to turn out. You know, recently at my church, our pastor is Father Frank O'Connor. He's actually a Catholic priest, but he's also what I refer to as a street priest who's been working with people in poverty for many, many, many years. And he gave a homily and he said, um, it is through suffering and through the broken heart that the Lord Jesus enters in. And I believe that. I believe that we've all gone through terrible things in life that, you know, our own suffering, so to speak. And these families who are struggling right now, sometimes the experiences that we've had, we can touch them in a very, very special way, in a meaningful way. So I'd ask you to pray and think about maybe how you can get involved with Family Promise. And I'm so happy that you refer to it as a, as a ministry, Pastor Karen, because I do too. You know, it is an organization. You know, we don't accept it what we call government funding. We don't want to. We want to be able to do our own thing and do it the way we want to and just bring people together. But I will mention that we do, we do have an event. It's called Doors to the Future. <laughs> and I very uh, quickly gave one of these to Irene Harbison when I came in today. But if you'd like to come to this event, it's a wonderful way to show support for our program. Um, if you let me know, you can just call this number and, and I'll tell you more about it or visit our website, which is familypromiseofthecapitalregion.org. I'd like you to, to, to think about coming and not only to learn more about the program, but it's a wonderful way to show support. And anytime we have something going on with the program, I'll certainly let you guys know about it so that you can participate. I also gave several brochures to Irene that she can, you know, kind of lays out the nuts and bolts of the program. I touched on how we do it, but this brochure really explains it very well. <laughs> and on the back of the brochure, you'll see a list of all the congregations that participate. I think that's nice, too. I mean, when you think about what we're doing collectively, all these faith communities coming together to show the love and support to our neighbor, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to help them really look forward to a better tomorrow. So thank you so much for being, for allowing me to be here with you today. I will be at, around afterward to visit with you and any questions you may have, you may certainly ask me or any of the wonderful volunteers. And I also want to say one more thing. The music here is amazing. And just to show you that it's proof that anybody can do it, I was a music teacher. For many years, I, I left teaching when my children were born and I never dreamed I'd be doing this. So <laughs> here you go. So thank you, and thank you to the, to the wonderful choir and for allowing me to be here today. Well, before you step away, Mary, yes. I would like us to have a prayer for, for the Ministry of Family Promise and for Mary Giordano. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, which truly makes us one beyond um, the names that we call ourselves and the organizations, the faith community we belong to. We are one in you. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that Mary shares with people in need and with the communities of faith. We ask that you bless her in her work and bless this ministry, which upholds the, some of the most vulnerable in our midst. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for what you do, Mary.